Amen. Well, good evening to everyone. Um, just a, a joy to uh, to meet with you tonight and spend a little bit of time together. I'm going to uh, share my screen and let's see if we can make this happen. And um, we'll go from there. First, I should um, I should bring this down so you can all see my grandsons. Okay. All right. Enough of enough of that. So let me just uh, make it look pretty. Okay. So um, you can all see my screen. Yeah. Okay. I can't see your faces because I only have one screen, but. Uh, I'll just assume you're all happy, smiling, nodding, and supportive of everything I say. So, <laughs> but th I thought tonight might um, kind of touch on um, this topic of this last dispensation of time. And um, if you recall, a while back, the quorum put together uh, kind of a series of, um, well, they became, they first started out as a uh, one article and it grew to multiple articles that we ultimately put together into an electronic kind of ebook um, that put them all together. They were all published in the gospel news. Um, and, and this is kind of a, I'll say a high level summary of that, that at least gets us thinking a little bit more and, and focusing a little bit more about the period of time that we live in and um, periods of time that have existed and also what we have to look forward to. So um, let's see if we can move forward here. And the first question really is, you know, what's a dispensation, right? So in scripture, a, a dispensation is essentially a, a, a set of conditions that, that God has, you know, in, in force, if you will, uh, for a particular group of people or, or for a particular time frame as the next bullet uh, kind of notes. It's really about the condition that, you know, is for a set period of time, not, not, you know, always specific around a certain duration, but kind of eras of time, you might think of it as. Here's a few examples. So, you know, these are found in the scriptures, right? So, like the Garden of Eden, or, or creation was an era of time. Um, you say, well, how long was that? Well, you know, it was um, a, a short period relative to other uh, time frames that existed, but it, it was a portion that we can kind of focus on. We think about, well, you know, the creation of, as God created the world. Um, the flood would be another dispensation of time and the events that led up to the flood, the flood itself, and, you know, right after that. Um, the, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham was, you know, kind of a, a milestone or a, a, a a dispensation, a, a point in time. Um, the entire Old Testament law, right, could be a, a window of time, a dispensation, an era. Um, the, the, the time of, of the, the kings and judges of Israel could be considered a, a dispensation or an era of time. Um, maybe just the life of Christ, the New Testament, an era of time. The apostasy, the restoration. So just different examples of different windows, events that, that we can kind of put uh, boundaries around and, and understand what was going on during that window or, or that period or that condition. So, you know, what, what lies in our future? Well, red letters, Jesus said this, but of the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Watch therefore. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, if the good man of the house had known in what, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think, not the Son of Man cometh. So it's obviously found in the book of Matthew and in its words of Christ, reminding us that, that you know, we, we live in the moment we live today um, and we need to be mindful watchful of what exists today it's great to learn from the past it's good to understand those dispensations but 
This is the dispensation of time given to you and I. Tonight is our moment. It's our hour. We don't know what tomorrow will hold. Um, now, we know what the scripture tells us, and we'll talk about that in a little bit about what the future holds, but that may not be for me or for you. It, we know that's going to exist, um, but we each have our own um, personal dispensation, if you will, and we don't know the, 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 the length of that either. So for the church, you know, we've been blessed, obviously, with, I'll say, an abundant understanding of, of related events that occur and that connect this dispensation of time. And I say we've been blessed because we have the benefit of the Bible and the Book of Mormon working together, um, coupled with, you know, even uh, current, I'll say, revelations that the Lord gives to us from time to time as a church to reinforce to remind us, to, to uh, maybe enlighten us um, without the Book of Mormon. Clearly, many of the things that the Christian world understands is not quite as clear as, uh, as what we have. And that's why, you know, at my words, we've been blessed with an abundant understanding. And that, to me, is one of the joys and one of the, I'll, I'll say the word privilege we have as knowing the restoration. Um, and all that surrounds it. So th this presentation is you know, kind of a summary of events, right, that are found in the scripture. It's not a, a definite timeline of order that we should think of as this is all sequential. Um, now, I'll say directionally it's sequential, but w are there things that overlap? Absolutely. Uh, do I have all the answers? No. Uh, does the Quorum of 12 have all the answers? No. Um, we, we all have many of the pieces, right? We've got, if you're building a puzzle, at least the way I build a puzzle, I usually work with the outline first, you get the edges and you start kind of working and we've got the outline of the puzzle. We're, we're really clear about what those boundaries are. That's what we're going to talk about this evening. There's a lot that has to be filled in and those details, those, those individual pieces that sometimes take forever to find just the right spot and you try and you try to fit it in, at least that's how I, you know, and usually I'm the one pushing it in and my wife is saying that doesn't fit there. Well, spiritually, we have to be careful that we aren't force fitting things. So we have the big, we have the outline with the frame. Um, we've got a lot of pieces of that puzzle. We know a lot of those pieces. They aren't always crystal clear and they aren't clear until they, till the Lord kind of lays it in that place for us. But um, this is a, an overview or a summary of that. And so Here's a, a, a quick list of the, the events in this last dispensation of time. And it really starts with, with the restoration. Um, you know, uh, and these are just categories that you know, we've, we've kind of captured, right? So the restoration occurs. There's some level of wickedness or sin that continues to increase. There's a judgment that's made that basically from the Lord that says it's time for Joseph to return, for Zion to be built, for Israel to be all gathered. That we, we talk about the last days, right, are now upon us because now Christ returns, judgment day occurs, and eternity. You know, we, we, we live for all eternity beyond that. Well, all will live for eternity. It's just a matter of when we resurrect, where will we be consigned, right? So, um, th these are events that, you know, we, many of these we look forward to. I mean, we all look forward to Zion, right? We look forward to the return of Joseph and Israel. Well, we don't look forward to things like wickedness or sin. Um, you know, and for many, Judgment Day will be a hard day. And we all want to have a smile on the Lord's face when he judges us each individually. Um, but, you know, for all of this is not happiness and and just joy, uh, there's, there's some challenges along the way. And, and again, as I mentioned, some of this overlaps a little bit, and it's not necessarily intended to be um, discrete, definitive lines drawn between each one of these bullets, but just wanted to kind of outline that. We're going to uh, kind of go into each of these in a little bit more detail. So the last, um, the, re the restoration is the first one, right? So I, I, this should be um, a bit of a history lesson for all of us um, and, and a familiar one, right? So uh, the, the church has been restored, the gospel, 
uh, the true teachings of Christ, the, the priesthood authority, all is restored and established on, on the face of the earth again. The authority we know was returned in 1829, along with the Book of Mormon being published, and, and ultimately restored to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles would bring the gospel to Joseph, and, and ultimately to all the world, right? Um, I, this is a little bit of, I hope, motherhood and apple pie for all of us, right? This this is uh, kind of the foundation of the restoration that that we've um, we've learned, we've taught, we've fallen in love with, and and that we um, hold true again, Bible, Book of Mormon, together in God's hand. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it says the authority returned on earth in 1829. When did uh, the split between the restoration and the take place? Brother Mike, could you just repeat the last sentence? You cut out a little bit. I couldn't hear you. Uh, the authority was uh, restored in 1829. So when did the split take place between the restoration and our church? So um, I think you're you're asking about the kind of the split of the multiple different fac factions of the of the those who um, believe in the Book of Mormon. Right. Okay. And, and I I'm repeating that. It, oh, I can't see you because I only have that one screen. So I apologize. Um, Want to make sure I, I got it right. So <laughs> there are obviously many um, factions that broke apart uh, throughout from uh, once the gospel was restored. Um, some that went. And we know that there's, you know, many um, factions. So they were really staggered over a number of years that ranged from the late 30s um, to the 1860s and, and beyond, right? There continue to be various factions. But um, when we talk about the authority, you know, we believe as a church that that priesthood authority was restored, as would all restoration churches, right? And we believe that that, that that authority continues to rest with our church, right? And that those who broke away or, or went in different factions or different directions um, did not retain that authority because of the changes that they made. And so um, I believe, and I could stand corrected here, but I believe of all the restoration churches that exist today, we're the only church that uses the Bible and Book of Mormon and claims priesthood authority. Everyone else has variations of, of different records, different interpretations, um, different additional books. Um, at the end of the day, the, the authority, some will say is traced because of the lineage of Joseph Smith. Some will say because of this or that. At the, in my opinion, the authority is, isn't by um, continuity of name, but rather by demonstration of the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. And, and if we possess that authority, then we should be demonstrating that gift and power of the Holy Ghost in our preaching, in our teaching, in, our, in the healings, in the miracles, in the revelations, that, that the church that Christ restored is true to that same New Testament church in its fullness with no deviation. And I believe, I hope we all believe that that authority and that practice and that gift and power exists within the Church of Jesus Christ that you and I are members of. Is that helpful, Brother Mike? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, next window of time is this wickedness, right? So, sinful condition of the Gentiles has been warned in Third Nephi. Talks about the 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 uh, fullness of the of the uh, of the gospel being rejected, right? And and today, you know, you say, well, what, what does that mean? Um, again, this isn't like, again, in my opinion, one day this is going to just occur. Um, because sin becomes widespread and it grows in things like pride and lying, murders, whoredoms. I mean, we can go on with this list. It, it's sadly, it's endless because uh, as the Book of Mormon tells us, there's divers ways in which men uh, choose to find, uh, you know, to sin. Um, but what we find, and I think we'd all agree, conditions continue to worsen, that what was not sin before is now, con or what was never considered uh, acceptable is now acceptable. That was 
that was, you know, um, uh, pleasing to God. Now things are changing. And the world in which we live will call, you know, that which is good wrong, wrong and that which is wrong good. Um, uh, and sadly, we see this increasing and increasing, growing worse and worse and worse to some point at which the Lord will say enough. And that's the warning. And so what I you know, like to remind everyone is this doesn't have to happen, that if the Gentiles and if the world would turn to Christ, there doesn't have to be this um, uh, judgment, right? This cleansing of the land, if you will, the preparation for Zion. It, it's only going to happen because of sin. But if the Gentiles don't repent and don't turn from their wickedness and don't re uh, reject the gospel, well, this is what's going to happen. So, you know, we see, sadly, we see this condition uh, existing in our day and time um, amongst the Gentiles, where, where what God calls sin, people would say, that's not sin, nothing wrong with it, you're judging me, or that's not love, or well, you're not showing me, you're not showing, you know, love of God towards me. Um, I hope we all love everyone. I don't care what things they're involved in. We all sin before the Lord. We all come short for the Lord, and we still need to love one another, uh, no matter what degree or amount or condition or state of sin. Um, but the act of sin, the sin itself is still wrong, and, and that we can't love, and that we shouldn't accept. And as that acceptance becomes more common and, and more... Um, generalized across the Gentiles. This is what, you know, third Nephi uh, 16 chapter warns against. And these are just a couple examples, but clearly there are many, uh, many of them. So in order for the next window, right, Zion to be established, there is a judgment, right? In order to build God's kingdom on earth, the land must be clean from sin. Um, or at least those who possess it. And the, again, Book of Mormon is very clear about that. Uh, both Book of Ether and Third Nephi speaks of this, um, the importance of, uh, of building Zion. And it has to be built, you know, pardon the expression, on a good foundation. And that foundation can't be sin. It can't be on wickedness. It has to be on the, on the standard of Christ and on his, on his righteousness. And so that's, that's the standard that we're asked to live our lives to. It's the standard that we've committed the Lord, uh, what we committed to the Lord at the water's shore, that uh, we, would, we would do our very best to love and serve him, and that we would stay away from sin. And that's, that's what we preach. That's what we desire for all mankind, uh, that every soul would find Christ and find that, uh, enter into that covenant, find that relationship, and not find themselves possessed by or overcome by or or uh, um, become submissive to sin. Unfortunately, that's not what we see today. And you know, that's kind of a sad note. Um, as I said, you know, everything in this dispensation of time is not necessarily happy and pleasing. And what comes along with this judgment you know, is part of that gray area. It's part of the piece of the puzzle that isn't always that clear. And one of the things that the Lord, I think, has shared and revealed in pieces to the church over the past recent years, I'll say, is that, you know, we may not always know every piece of the puzzle, but what we do know is if we rely on him, if we trust him, if we're confident in him, if that's where our security is found, then we don't really need to be so concerned and so troubled and so worried with anxiety and fear over how will this occur? And what type of judgment is going to occur and who's going to be affected by it? And, and will it be economic destruction? Will it be physical? Will it be literal? Will it be figurative? Yes and no. And it doesn't matter because what the Lord, I believe, has been telling us is put your heart where it belongs. Love me. Serve me. Be confident in me. Trust me. Exercise your faith in me. And no matter what comes, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's economic disaster, uh, you know, the economy fails and, and we go into a depression um, or there's, you know, physical destructions, famine, whatever it might be, trust me, 
rely on me. And, you know, I was reading uh, an experience and maybe some of you are familiar with this. It's in the uh, church history book. Um, and it happened around Thanksgiving, which is why I like to read it at Thanksgiving time. Uh, Sister Framelin, a, a knock came at her door. Uh, it was during the Depression years. It didn't have much. And um, there was a man at the door. And uh, he had food in his hand. He had a fresh chicken, I believe, or turkey, uh, vegetables. And that night, um, you know, she had nothing to serve the kids except beans. Uh, he, you know, didn't have much food in the house. And this man knocks the door and gives them this food. And she spoke with the man, handed her the food. And I'm abbreviating this, but but, you know, it turned away, looked back, man disappeared. Angel of God provides this meal. And the next day, they invited the saints to come over for Thanksgiving. Um, uh, Framlin uh, family, the Campatelli family, as they, were, as they were about ready to have their meal, they had a word of prayer. And they rehearsed that this man had come. And they believed it was, you know, divine. And um, as, as they rehearsed this, um, it was either a voice or a personage appeared, and the words essentially were, as I fed my people in the times of Moses, I will feed my people now. And they, they said, well, you know, what a great blessing they felt. But to me, it's just a reminder of God's taking care of his people, and that's always been his promise. And that's what we need to place our heart on, not necessarily on how this will all play out. Um, I'm sure the Lord will will reveal as he needs to, to us. And I'm sure he'll tell us what to do, where to go, how to do it, when to do it. And until then, we remain faithful and confident in him. So we don't want to see people swept off the land, but the scripture is very clear about that if they don't repent. And no matter what, the scripture does tell us, and the Lord's reminded us many times that the righteous need not fear that we be spiritually prepared by, by purifying ourselves, repenting daily, fasting and praying, learning his word, um, possessing the pure love of Christ, charity, separating ourselves from sin. I mean, that's, I, say, I was going to say that's all the Lord asks us to do. That's a lot in many respects, but in the big picture, it's exactly what we covenanted with him on the water shore. We, we, we covenanted with him that we would serve him to the best of our ability. And these are the tools to help us to the best of our ability, fulfill that fasting and praying, reading, uh, following the, the spirit of God, uh, possessing charity, uh, separating ourselves from sin, uh, repenting on a daily basis. Uh, when we do those things, we are in fact upholding that covenant. So the next um, window here is Joseph returns and, uh, you know, this is something that obviously as a church, we, we sing about, we, we anticipate, because we know with, with Joseph returning, right, comes the choice seer. And, and the, the amazing results and, and impact that this seer, Joseph, will have on his people and frankly on the church, right? I mean, th this will be a man who's able to translate records. Well, it's great to have a skill a talent, a blessing to be able to translate records, that means there's going to be records to translate. That means there's going to be more things to learn about how God dealt with other tribes, right? And how God dealt with his people in, in other ways, maybe greater details beyond what we have recorded for those here in the Americas. Um, so obviously, not only will, will that be one of the benefits of the choice here, but maybe the most important is that that he will be so instrumental in being used of God to convince the, his people, right? The, the, the First Nations people, the seed of Joseph, the Native American, of, of, the, of the word of God, of the, the authority of Christ, um, of Christ, of, of the fact that he died for them and that he resurrected after three days in the tomb, that, that there's salvation available, not by by mother earth or by worshiping, you know, uh, creatures of this, of this world or through their tribal beliefs um, that have been twisted over the years through, you know, various ideas. 
but through the purity of the gospel that you and I have. And as Gentiles and the followers of Christ from the tribe of Joseph, that we would build the new Jerusalem and establish Zion in the land of America in the flesh. And of course, we refer to that as the peaceful reign. And I mean, again, much of what we, you know, kind of our aspirational forward vision is focused about around this. And sometimes we want to skip over the other things that I mentioned earlier. But the truth is, these are all parts of that dispensation that will occur. And it's good to focus on the positive things and the happy things and the joyful things, uh, because this is one of the things, if you think about it, Christ desired to bring Israel together, and he was not able to do that. He, he, how many times, right, he said, I would, as a, as a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. Israel did not want to find him and accept him as a savior, as a son of God. And so, you know, if we go back again to the covenant with Abraham, right? Continuing through the time of Christ, all of this still his chosen people. And the Lord's never forgotten that covenant and never will. That never forgets a covenant. Never lets down his side of that, that, uh, that covenant. And, and wants to use you and I and Joseph to help gather Israel and to build this, this new Jerusalem, to establish a kingdom of Zion, the, the kingdom of God on earth, in the flesh. Uh, the best we have is fourth Nephi as, as what that condition might be like. But what we don't have there is all of Israel gathered. We don't have the Gentiles mingled among them in fourth Nephi. We don't have that fullness uh, that the Lord longs for and, and desires to see as part of this dispensation. So comes, you know, then comes the peaceful reign, right? Um, and, and this will last, at least we'll say a long time, hundreds of years. It, it, it's, it's different opinions about exactly how some say it's, you know, it's, it's this long minus this, and they've got a mathematical equation. It's a long time. And, you know, frankly, I'm content with that. I don't need to know the exact dates. I don't need to know the exact hour. Um, I'll just be thrilled. I think we all will be just to be there. And, and if, if we, you know, um, uh, if it's 100 years, if it's 500 years, um, it'll all be good. It'll all be great. Why? Because Christ will visit us. We will live in a, in a peaceful condition that has been dreamed of, sung about, and hoped for probably since the beginning of, since Eden. Um, and, and so uh, however long that lasts, it will be a long time. And so we look forward to that, right? It's, it's the kingdom of earth, uh, the kingdom of Christ on earth that, that Daniel refers to uh, in the seventh chapter as the ancient of days. It is, it's the fact that the devil will have no power because of the righteousness of the saints. I mean, just, there's a, there's a lesson just right there. Imagine the time, I don't know if we can conceive of what that's like, because our entire lives, the flesh lusts against the spirit. There's that constant battle. In this day and time, that battle won't exist because the devil will have no power because of the righteousness of his people. Um, we've never been so righteous, and we've never had that, that lack of evil coming against us. But that will be the condition you know, that we'll experience in that day and time. So ultimately, the building of, of, of Zion prepares the place, if you will, for all of Israel to return. And, and this is that time, again, where, you know, we don't, we don't always talk about or sometimes it's uncomfortable because it, it, it's very finite that there are saved two churches only, the Church of the Lamb of God and the Church of the Devil. I mean, that's very finite. Um, very absolute. And that, that can hurt some people at times. They can be offended by that concept. Um, uh, and, 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 and I understand that. I can appreciate that. You know, I, many of you know I wasn't born and raised in the church. And uh, I'm sure if someone was to say this to me um, as a member of the church, looking to someone who's not and to say, you know, someday it's going to come down to two churches. You're either with us or you're not. 
meaning you come my way or you're you're of the devil, that, that sounds pretty condemning, right? I mean, it sounds very judgmental as well. And so this is a hard concept, but the truth is it's the word of God. And, and we believe this will actually happen and it will come down to two churches. And, and as finite and as specific as this is, to me, it makes sense because, you know, there's a lot of confusion today, um, obviously, even among the Christian faiths. But beyond that, there's the Hindus, there's the Muslims, there's the uh, Buddhists. The, I mean, I, and, and there are many wonderful people who are, in their own way, I'll say righteous. Um, whether they have one God or multiple gods, they're devout, very dedicated, very sincere. In fact, in some respects, maybe more sincere than I am or than, than some of our members. Their, their devotion and their dedication, maybe for other reasons, and again, I can't judge that, but I believe there's many good people who don't yet know Christ or don't yet understand the fullness of the gospel that, that the Lord has blessed us with, that when it comes down to having to make a choice between this or that, they're going to pick, they're going to pick the true church. They're going to pick the church of the Lamb of God because they're, they're kind, loving, sincere, dedicated, devout people who, whose eyes will now be opened. And when given the choice between this or that, this is glorious, just, just, you know, beautiful and, and glorious, that is ugly. And I believe many will choose the Lamb of God. Um, and, and now it's just my opinion, but I see many good people in the world today um, who just have never been privileged as I have been, as you have been, to have felt the Spirit of God, to have even been taught, um, to have been blessed in the way we have been. And, and um, so this is, it comes down to this at that point in time, right? The believing Jews will be converted to Christ, as we, we read in throughout the Old Testament. Um, and, and obviously in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel, it will also be rebuilt um, to the house of Israel. So, so the land of, of, uh, of Jerusalem uh, will also be, Jerusalem of today will be reestablished as well. So all of these events lie in our future. And, and these, are, these are like huge events when you think about it, right? I, I mean, these, are, um, these aren't like, oh yeah, I, I read about that. I heard that uh, Zion was being built. Oh yeah, I, I saw in the news that, um, that nobody has, yeah, I heard that all the Jews are, Jews are being converted to Christ. I, yeah, no big deal. I mean, these are like big deals, right? These are huge milestones in the Lord's timeline, if you will, during this last dispensation of time. And this is part of that covenant that he made with, with Abraham, that he would gather them and number them as the stars in the, in the heavens and the, the sand and the seashore, and he would gather them and he would bring them together. So the tribes now come together. Israel's gather, as you read in the book of Ezekiel, their, their, their bones are, are uh, you know, uh, been breathed in with new life and, and flesh on those bones. And then the invitation is extended to all nations to love and follow Christ, as we read in, in 2 Daniel. And uh, it, as we get to this point now in time, right? So Zion is built in this land. Israel's being gathered. Others are extended that invitation. Then for a time, evil returns and the peaceful reign is shortened for, for the sake of the elect, the scripture tells us. Again, when? I don't know. For how long? I don't know. But, but for some reason, this evil is permitted to return back, right? And, it, and, and the Lord shortens the days of this, this reign of time and it ends you know, with the, with the gathering and this kind of disposition of the good versus the bad. And this now, we're kind of now approaching the, the end time, if you will, right? Because now we've we kind of lived out the, 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 the time of Zion. And we've, we've seen the, the joy of Christ visiting us. We've, we've seen Israel gathered and others coming in as well. And now comes that kind of last leg, if you will. Now we're, again, kind of sequentially at the end of this, this process. Christ returns. There's a glorious day. 
pretty big milestone on on everyone's calendar, right? And of course, our, our bodies uh, comes the resurrection. Our body and soul reunite, as we read in the 40th chapter of Alma. And and you know, this is the first resurrection for the redeemed, right? Since uh, the, the the resurrection of Christ, and and we'll be joined with Christ at His coming. We'll dwell with Him during the millennial reign, which we read of in the book of Revelation. Judgment Day, evil power and his followers march against the camp of the, of the saints. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours the evil. Death and hell and the devil will be cast into the lake of fire. And I'll just simply say once and for all and for good. Um, and from there, you know, Judgment Day occurs at the throne of God, right? Where Christ is the judge. The books are open wide. And if your name is not found in that book, you're, you're not going to be numbered among those who enter in. And if your name is found in the Lamb's Book of Life and you've proven faithful to the end, the reward will be yours, be ours. And then for all eternity, right? The scripture says, God will wipe away all of our tears. No more sorrow, no more death. All the redeemed will spend eternity with God and Christ inhabiting a new heaven and a new earth. And there'll be no new temple. Lord God Almighty, the Lamb are the temple of the holy city. So, having said all of that, we just covered from the restoration. We, we went from 1829 to the end of the world, right? In in less than 30 minutes. Um, so, what do I do though, right? What, what do I do now? Is to me the question. Um, well, I, I would tell you. I think the importance is we read and study the Word of God with diligence, and I say that because everything we need is contained within the word of God. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't need a spirit. doesn't mean that we don't need, you know, revelation, which, which we so much enjoy. It doesn't mean we don't need the blessings of God. But the, the direction that we need in our life is found in the word of God. The word of God tells us how the evil one comes against us, how he'll try to deceive or lie to us and lead us into sin. It, it tells us how we can lead a, a, a spiritual life how we can draw closer to the Lord and how his spirit can work with us and how we can choose to let that spirit work with us or choose not to. It's all contained within it. And, and oftentimes I just give you my opinion and I'll speak for myself. I don't know enough of the word of God. I, I, I could be a better student of the word and, and I have, you know, tried to make it and I, and I strive to do better being a better student of the word. And sometimes that means I need to pray about what I'm reading, fast and pray. Lord, illuminate my mind. Open up the mysteries to me. Help me understand this. Because listen, when sometimes when you read the book of Isaiah or, or Revelation, or especially, you know, some of the prophets of old, it's not always crystal clear. But the Lord can open our heart and our mind to understand this. That we not let our temporal life distract us from our spiritual life. And it really says to me, it's about prioritizing in our life. And the truth is, often we put our temporal life in the forefront and our spiritual life is second. You know, well, and, and, and why do we do that? Well, because when I wake up in the morning, I'm, I'm hungry. I have to be a breakfast eater, and lunch and dinner too. So, so uh, you know, I'm three meals a day kind of guy. So I get up in the morning, my stomach's hungry. I get up in the morning, I take a shower, you know. I get up in the morning, I dress myself, I, I go to work, I, I do a lot of temporal things. And so we find ourselves like sometimes thinking, well, I'll spend 15 minutes reading the scripture, or I'll, I'll, I'll pray for a few minutes, uh, you know, when I get up in the morning. Uh, we, we like, we kind of segment this little, these little portions of our spiritual life, you know, kind of amongst our temporal life. And frankly, I would tell you, I need to figure out a better way to have a spiritual life and to figure in ways to just slice in the temporal portions because um, we can get overwhelmed by the, by the natural things. They aren't even sinful. They're just natural things by, well, you know, I'm, 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 I want to eat some more. I'm never satisfied with what I am. I'm always looking for something different to eat, more variety, blah, blah, blah. Or these clothes, well, this is a nice shirt, but I want a different shirt, a better shirt, a, a, a better iron shirt, a cleaner shirt. I get consumed with those things when in fact, 
my life really should be a spiritual life first and everything else second. And so that's a challenge for, for me. I'll just speak for myself to make that spiritual life, the priority and our temporal life kind of second. And, and I used intentionally the word distractions here because I, I think there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of things that distract us, distract me that aren't sinful by their nature, but they still distract me and they take me away from my spiritual life. And so for, for many years, I was, I always had this mindset of, well, it's good to balance these things. You know, I've got a family, I've got a job, I've got, as a minister, a church, um, you know, I want to balance all of these things. And the truth I've come to realize is there is no good balance. There's no really way to say my, my, my wife is more important than, than God and my soul. My, my children are more important. My job is more important. My, all of those things are necessary. And I, and I appreciate and love my wife, my family, maybe not my job, but, but I'm thankful for it for sure. But my soul, my spiritual life, there's, there's no comparison in the big picture. In the, in the big picture, eternity and what I do with my spiritual life now, there's really no comparison as to whether I took that job or that job, whether I got a promotion or didn't get a promotion, whether I dressed that way or this way, whether my house was this big or that big, whether I drove that car or this car. Those things in the big picture really don't matter. I mean, they, they can consume us, I know, but it's really about that not permitting ourselves to be distracted by those things. I still need a car, still need a house to live in. I still need clothes to wear. I, I still need a job. Yes. But how do those things highlight or amplify or benefit my spiritual life? Did I, did I buy too big of a house and now I'm strapped and now I have to work more? Or could I have been more wise and bought a less expensive home so that it, I'm not tied down by my job to give me more time spiritually? Could I, you know, am I raising my children in a spiritual way versus I'm just reading books and I'm doing whatever the, the, the doctor says to do versus how does the Lord direct me to raise my children and teach them and guide them? So how does that become dominant in my life versus the temporal things, right? So what else should I do? Well, how about attending church or scripture studies, right? Uh, Zoom meetings, uh, engaging the brothers and sisters, fellowship, um, being part of the body. That, that's one of the ways that we help to build our spiritual life, right? Um, being intentional about our thoughts and our actions and asking ourselves, you know, that kind of that cliche, what would Jesus do? Um, being intentional and asking ourselves, how do I, how does this Lord fit in? When I'm at work, you know, I'm, I'm asking the Lord, how does this, how does this job, how does this interaction with this person, how can this play a part in my spiritual life? How can I help them? I have to work. I'm thankful for my job. I earn a living, provide for my family, but I'm also interacting with people whose lives I touch. How can I make a difference in their lives? So being intentional about those types of things, right? Walking in the light, not in the darkness. Maybe that's pretty obvious, right? But seeking to draw near to the Lord and his gospel on a daily basis. Earlier, I said, you know, repenting daily. It, this, these are daily tasks that I believe we need to be doing now. Jesus reminds us, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, I think this is like my last slide. So continue to uh, prepare through purification and sanctification. You know, Brother Bob uh, uh, Watson wrote a, uh, a pamphlet, a, a divine, um, no, no, um, gosh, I just lost the name of it. He wrote a pamphlet, it'll come to me. Uh, and, and there's a chapter in it that talks about the importance of purification and sanctification. The, the scriptures replete with examples of the importance of purifying ourselves, of sanctifying ourselves. Why? Because the Lord can't use us if we're not pure, if we're not sanctified. And that sounds like, you know, we're something, you know, very special and very holy and, and, and we are. And this is God's temple. And, and he, 
and he actually placed his spirit to dwell within us. He must think pretty highly of us that he would do something like that. And all he asks in return is that we keep it pure and sanctified. Repent daily. I think that should say remain rather than remain humble. Uh, it's good to be remain humble, right? And separate ourselves from sin. Um, maintain the pure love of Christ. Charity. Not an easy task, especially when people treat you in ways that are less than admirable. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, we, we look at individuals. Sometimes we look at other members in the church and we, we judge them, right? We, we look at, well, they did this to me. They said this and that hurt me a, a little bit. Not, I wasn't too offended. Not enough to use the law of offense, but it bothered me. It hurt me. It upset me. And we, 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 we hold on to that and we can't look past that to see in their heart, they love the Lord. They love Christ. And all that the Lord asks for me is to love them as Jesus would love them. And, and he would, while all those things might be true, maybe they did say something that hurt me. Maybe they did do something intentional or unintentional that, that made me feel bad. I'm not their judge at the end of the day. And what the Lord has given to me is to love them despite that. And that's not always easy to do. But the Lord asks us, that we would possess the pure love of Christ. And when you look at how Christ treated others, they despitefully used him. They well, crucified him, obviously, but, but they, they tried to corner him. You know, they, they did the sneaky things. It's one thing to crucify the Savior, and that's pretty bad, right? But, but they, 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 they tried to trick him. They tried to catch him. They tried to back him into the corner. Oh, I, I see that you're I see that your disciples are healing on the, on the Sabbath day. Well, we got to call you out for that. Oh, I, I see that, you know, um, on the Sabbath, you're doing this, or uh, I see that you're healing, and, and this is heresy. This is, you know, blasphemy. It, they were always trying to capture him in a, in a way where they could point a finger and say, see, we, 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 we caught him. We got him um, in, a, in kind of a, a tricky little way. Christ, he looked beyond that. He still loved them. He still extended himself to them over and over and over. He engaged the scribes and Pharisees. What a great role model, right? I mean, a lot of times for us, it's that person bothers me, so I keep my distance. Christ, he was just the opposite. He, I don't care how much you bother me, how much you're trying to pin me against the wall. I'm not going to change, and I'm still going to love you. I'm, I'm going to continue to love you no matter what. That's what the Lord asks of us. It's not an easy task, to be sure. Um, but if we remain humble, if we repent, if we draw close to him, I, I believe this is attainable. I believe perfection is possible. Now, when was I perfect? No, well, I'm not there yet. But I, I, I mean, the, the scripture is pretty clear to me. Be perfect as my father in heaven is. So that's a goal. It comes through these, these acts and through this purification and sanctification. And maybe we'll be perfect for a millisecond. Well, the next time, how about two milliseconds? How about a whole second, right? That Just that moment. And, and think about in our lives, the, those moments when we've been overwhelmed by the Spirit of God, when we're just consumed by it, sometimes it's just, just for a few moments. Maybe it's during a worship service in church. Maybe it's in our closet when we're in prayer and, and we're, we're just, you know, breaking our heart to the Lord. In those moments, I would offer, we're perfect because that's what the Lord asks of us. And that's when we can possess that pure love of Christ. In those moments, when, we're let, when we feel that way, we don't harbor any ill feelings towards anyone. We don't think about the time that person said that to me and it kind of bothered me or it hurt me. We, we just feel love. We feel joy. We feel the peace of Christ. That's what he wants for us. So living and worshiping in unity, in righteousness. I mean, this is part of our vision as a church that we would fellowship, and that because of our fellowship and our worship together and our righteousness, that others would be drawn to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the restored gospel. Others would see, whether that's on a Sunday morning or whether that's in my walk individually, individuals would be drawn to me when I'm at work or to you when you're at school or in the grocery store, and they would say, there's something different about you. And we hear that from time to time, right? So, you know, and someone, I don't know, there's something different about you. What is that? I, I hope we're all quick to say, 
It's because I love the Lord. It's because of Christ in me, right? Not, well, shucks, you know, there's nothing good in me. No, 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 don't, don't ever think that. There is something good in us. It's Christ. That's what they see. That's the, the, the glow, if you will, that they see in us. So ultimately, it's reaching out to those lost in sin, that they would find salvation through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. That's what this is all about. While we, while we love to think about Zion and we love to think about the gathering of Israel and Joseph coming back, this is all about souls being brought to Christ. And as a result, a kingdom will be built. As a result, they'll be gathered. But this is all about souls being brought to Christ, recognizing that atoning sacrifice. And that's what the choice seer will help to convince the, 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 his people of, that Christ was that, that great and last sacrifice. He died for their sins. He resurrected. That, that grave would no longer uh, be victorious over death and, and sin would be put, put to an end and that Christ would be the victor. So I believe that is my last um, um, slide. And I'm happy to take, uh, to have some dialogue, some questions. Um, I know you guys like to wrap up, I think in about five minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I can stay on as long as y'all would like to, and we can go from there. Brother, when you talked about souls coming to Christ, we had a wonderful happening in Hollywood, Florida this past Sunday. My brother-in-law, Bill Gennaro, was reinstated in the church after he has been out for over 40 years. Oh, beautiful. Oh. beautiful. He gave a very, yeah, very uh, repentant uh, testimony. Oh. We've been praying for his little great granddaughter who had uh, brain surgery, and she, and when he got the news that the doctor said it went very well, he just stood in testimony, praising God for taking care of his wonderful family, and just quietly said he wanted to be reinstated. So, um, my sister said the church was all in tears, and she and Bill were the only ones not crying because she was in <laughs> such shock. <laughs> but, that's beautiful, beautiful. You know, I, I um we had, I had a conference call actually last night with the Quorum Twelve, and um as, as we as we oftentimes do when we start, uh, we we share different happenings, if you will, going on in the church. And I think I heard of uh, two baptisms in Forest Hills. Um, you just mentioned a reinstatement. Um, there was a baptism uh, in uh, in Branch One in Michigan. I believe there was a. Um, Another baptism in, I think it was Sebenite had had a baptism. Uh, so there was a number of reinstatements, baptisms, souls coming to Christ. And that's, you know, we started our conversation out just kind of going through across the church because of, you know, all the different regions and is rejoicing in knowing that the Lord continues to do his perfect will and his perfect work in calling young and old, right? Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter uh, what you're facing or where you're at in your life. Um, the Lord calls all the day long. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. Sister Eileen, was that Sister Betty Gennaro's? Uh -huh. Yeah, my sister, my sister Betty is 89 and her husband is 92. He looked 60, but you know, he's been the kindest man. When my father was alive, my father would say, He's a very honorable person for someone that left the church. He's always been a very kind man, you know, and uh, very helpful to me with my blood work. You know, that was his uh, his work. And oh, uh, we just were praising God. I'll tell you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I hope you found the, um, the information valuable tonight. I, I'm sure it was a review for many of you, um, but I know as a quorum, as, again, as I referenced at the beginning, you know, we, we really took this concept of this last dispensation of time and tried to elaborate in much more detail um, and providing that to the, to the church, uh, feeling directed that uh, it's important that we understand, um, and in some respects, 
to understand what we believe and because there are many beliefs in the Christian world today of this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Well, what is it that we believe and what is it that the scripture tells us? And so we felt it was important to kind of lay that out, not necessarily with every last details I mentioned, but with a general understanding of this is what we have to look forward to because it's God's word. It's what God tells us is going to happen. And we're, we're privileged to live in a day and time during a dispensation when we're going to see, I believe, many of these things. Can I ask? I just want to say, Brother Frank, uh, hey, Brother Walt. Oh, I was going to say, Brother Frank, I really enjoyed the lesson. You streamlined it from all the stuff that I read and was really hitting the point. I, I, I enjoyed it tremendously, Brother. And also looking forward to seeing you at the rib weight on you. I haven't, I haven't forgotten my invitation. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, brother Walt said I had one hour, so, uh, you know, uh, I tried to, tried to put it into a, into a smaller window. Well, I say that, but you know, uh, with interest that, that you've piqued our interest so well tonight <laughs> that again, we're going to leave it open for as long as you East coasters can stay awake. You know, we, <laughs> we do that for you. So, uh, again, brother Frank, you, you, uh, you know, it took things that I guess we all know and, and put it in such a format that um, it was much easier to understand, kind of like the cliff notes version of, of a lesson that we had in school. Uh, you know, as I jotted down the notes here again, you know, things we should know and things we sometimes don't remember, uh, you brought to our mind tonight. I'm, I'm glad that, that we could do that because uh, uh, time is of the essence. We're in the last dispensation of time. And how long ago was it when Brother Paul Palmieri had that, uh, was it a dream or experience about uh, 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 this is our time? Um, five, six years ago? Yeah. yeah. And, and that kind of resonated with everybody, really. We tend to, like you say, get more involved with the business at hand for the day. And we forget about, you know, that this is our time, you know, to not only do the Lord's work, but to perhaps clean up our own acts a little bit better, you know, to get prepared. Because of looking here in the, you know, Alma says here in the 47th chapter, he says that we see there was a time granted unto men to repent, yea, a probationary time, a time to repent and serve God, which is our time right now. And uh, again, you know, we go from Sunday to Sunday. On Sundays, we were uplifted greatly, again, learning about the covenant of God and, and that we're a child of God and, and kind of came to our mind a little bit about some of our responsibility that we should be paying attention to. But that was Sunday, you know, and, and then comes Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday where life gets a hold of us, you know, and again, today you helped us, I guess, get back on track. So whatever we have to face for the rest of this week, hopefully we'll be walking a little bit closer to God and towards that element of perfection that you said that millisecond, you know, that we could kind of work on this week to be just a little more perfect than we are sometimes. So again, I, I thank you for your time and the effort to put forth. And if anybody else had any comments or whatever, I will fear to do that. But if not, we'll then we'll start wrapping it up. Brother Mike, did you have a comment? He's, I'm not hearing him. Um, you're muted, brother. Okay. How's that? There you go. Yep. Okay. I, uh, me and Barb felt we were directed to come out here. And the first day, first week I was out here, I met a Cherokee chief. And I became very good friends with them. I traveled with them, up at the different uh, meetings with them. And he died a couple weeks ago. So now I'm, I'm praying to the Lord. I said, now, now what? I thought, this, this was it. I, what am I supposed to do now? Sunday, a man approached me and asked me if I would go with him to the homeless. So the homeless has exploded out here in Independence. So I'm going to go down with him at 11 o'clock. He's going to show me, show me around introduce me and maybe that might be my calling and I ask ask for your prayers that the Lord would direct me. 
Thank you. God bless you, brother. We, you Thank know, we you. all, I think we all um, need to feel, and, and the Lord has a work for all of us, in, 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 sometimes it's multiple roles to play, right? But um, I think it's, it's important for all of us to be looking for those opportunities and to be putting forth the name of Christ and who we represent and w wherever that might be. And if, when, when you're introduced, uh, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ and I'm a servant of the Lord and I'm here to help you. Uh, what can I do for you? How can I serve you, right? That's whether you're a ordained minister, whether you're a member of the church, you know, no greater calling than being a member to be sure. And we all have a work to do and we all have a part to play in, in the building of that kingdom. Every soul needs to learn of Christ. Shine your light. We'll keep you in our prayers. Be safe. Brother Juan, you're doing a great job in that beard. You look like <laughs> a, a singer in the Oak Ridge Boys group. No, I don't think so. Uh, oh. <laughs> the beard maybe, but not the voice. <laughs> hey, Walt, I'm talking about ZZ Top. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jeremy, you want to kind of wrap it up and uh, just some of the closing prayer, and then uh, we'll see you next week what's going on, okay? Okay, that sounds good. Well, thank you for, for being with us tonight, Brother Frank. Um, I always enjoy uh, the, the gracious words and tone uh, of your delivery and um, the perspectives that you brought forth. And um, I just would say I appreciate the manner of in which, uh, you know, we heard that message delivered tonight in such a way that I think was, was more palatable, hopefully, to those who don't know as much about us. It's hard sometimes to put ourselves in their shoes. And, uh, and sometimes I think maybe in our efforts to spread the gospel, we say things in an off-putting way. And it's, it's, it's good to be careful with our words and try to spread the gospel with... Um, with a great deal of love and uh, know that those words might be the words that lead them to Christ. And so it's, it's worth taking that extra care in the way that we would uh, speak to others and be prepared, I think, to deliver such a message uh, to someone who needs to hear it. So a beautiful night, a beautiful uh, blessing many great reminders and a lot of information to soak in. And these are things we should be rehearsing and familiar with and able to, uh, to share, you know, with others. So uh, it's great to have you all tonight and uh, may God bless you as we uh, start a new month and uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, next, next Tuesday. Um, I think if there's nothing else, uh, Brother Juan, would you like to close us uh, in prayer tonight? Sure. Uh, just before we do, just to add to what uh, Jeremy said, uh, the way our, our brother presented this lesson, you know, uh, I think Jeremy said it, the way you delivered it, brother, the way you carry your words and all that, very calm and sincere. And, and that's something we all need to take account of when we speak to others. You know, Jer Jer Jeremy said it earlier, we may want to speak to somebody, but we sometimes may be too harsh or be too, sometimes too bold saying what we're saying and then offending somebody instead of attracting them closer to God. So we need to be mindful of what we say when we say it. And hopefully whatever words come out of my mouth when I tell somebody about God, hopefully it's the words that God gave me. Maybe my voice, but they should be God's words. Amen. It's about our heads. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Lord, we thank you for uh, the lesson was presented tonight, Lord, and a reminder to us, Lord, that, again, as our brother said, that, you know, none of us are perfect. And some of us may have been uh, born in the church. Some of us may have just come in recently. Some of us may be uh, joined years ago as myself, Lord. And every day it's a struggle to be able to, to do the right thing for some. Sometimes it's easier for others, but we must always remember that we can always improve no matter how many years we've been in the church, no matter how many uh, scriptures we've studied, no matter how many times we've read the Book of Mormon or the Bible from cover to cover, we can always learn something new, Lord. And I ask you, Lord, to help us with everything that we try to do. Take care of those that are not feeling well physically, Lord. Take care of those that are down spiritually. 
uh, they need an upliftment, Lord. Watch over them, take care of them all, Lord. And I'm thankful, Lord, for these Zoom meetings that we have, whether it's from Denver or Fort Worth or any other uh, location, Lord, that we're able to gather together and hear your word, Lord, and be able to grow in the things that we hear, Lord. For that, I am thankful, Lord. Bless those that were on this Zoom meeting. Bless those that that uh, that that have needs in their lives, Lord. Our brother Frank said it earlier so many times. We get up and we go through our daily routine. And then we come home and it's like, now we want to rest. I want to, don't want to do anymore. That we take the time each and every day to actually grow little by little as much as we can. For one day, you're going to use us all to do your work, Lord. And I ask, all, I ask you to just continue to be with us each and every day. I ask you all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. Love you all. Bye,